Well, hello, everybody. I am Andrew Hipsley. I'm the Dean of the Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Thank you for joining us for the first talk of a brand new series, Perspectives Reestablishing Reality. This is where we invite experts to share their expertise to help us make a sense of a world that has been upended. Uh, as we strive to live through the pandemic, we can feel confused by a thick blanket of information or misinformation that can be suffocating. Sometimes we feel there really must be two realities, or maybe even more. How do we make sense of a catastrophic event when the bare facts are disputed? And when a truth is rejected simply because it makes you feel uncomfortable. Our Reestablishing Reality series pulls the experts to center stage to help us to disentangle, pause, recalibrate, and find a way back to the long lost world of objectivity. A recurring and unsettling theme revolves around explanation. Holding on to a particular narrative is related to holding on to power. So what truth do you accept and why? Our first speaker of this five-part series is Dr. Jeffrey Jarman. Jeff Jarman is the Kansas Health Foundation Distinguished Director of the Elliott School of Communication, a position that he has held since 2017. For nearly 20 years, he served as the director of the university's competitive debate team. He teaches classes in communication strategy, research methods, and seminars in legal and political communication. His recent research applies insights from neuroscience and political psychology to classic conceptions of argumentation. In particular, he analyzes the role of evidence and argument in presidential debates, fact-checking, and political disputes in the public sphere. Since 1999, Dr. Jarman has authored the annual review the annual overview of the new high school debate topic used by thousands of high school debaters around the nation. Dr. Jarman also serves as a litigation consultant where he supports trial attorneys with case strategy, witness preparation, community, at, community attitude surveys, and mock trial research. Jeff Jarman will be speaking on motivated to ignore the facts. The difficulty of evidence, argument, and rationality in re-establishing reality. Please join me in welcoming Jeff. Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, appreciate everybody coming today. Uh, appreciate the Dean for hosting the series, uh, selecting the panel, and the opportunity to, to talk to you all today. I have a, a bunch of slides. Um, I'm not quite sure if the plan is for me to run through all of the slides and you ask questions at the end, but that doesn't seem like anything that we're all accustomed to. So feel free if you want to um, you know, unmute and ask a question along the way. Uh, I think I'm, I'm not, I'd much rather answer your question when it's timely than, than wait for the end. So uh, with that, let me, let me go ahead and, and try to get started. Um, so there are a number of things I want to talk about today. Essentially, uh, in, in, in the big picture, what I want to talk about is really two things. I know I've got like five or so things here, but really I want to talk about the brain and I want to talk about how we think and process information. And then I want to run through a series of studies that I've done recently to, to try to put into context how that really works for us. Uh, so that's re really what I'm after here. Let me start by talking about the brain and emotion and reason and rationality. Um, the classic conception of rationality is one where we think of how evidence helps the public make sense of the world around them. The, the, the view of rationality is one where we get information we, we update what we believe, the, the public can come together, learn, and then decide what makes sense for us. Uh, the, this view is really one where uh, the kind of cool process of rationality is one where we um, are dispassionate, where we get information, where we don't worry about what our prior beliefs are, but we could take in information and, and, and it would ultimately inform and, and influence us. 
The key to that really is rooted in the Enlightenment and the idea of dualisms where we have split things like rationality and reason from passion. And, and in that moment, we, we can relegate our passions, try ultimately to, to minimize their influence on us and be guided by our reason. It didn't start with uh, the Enlightenment, of course. Uh, if you go back plenty of years to Plato, some of you may recognize this as the allegory of the chariot and the charioteer. Uh, Plato told us in the Phaedrus that our soul was made up from, uh, you know, multiple elements. And in the allegory, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it a real disservice by summarizing it here in about with two sentences. But the idea is that we need the the strength of the charioteer, who in the in the image and in the allegory represents reason to control our passion represented by the by the dark horse it takes the the strength of reason to control our passion so that we are not overrun by our passion that's the classic conception going back even um, to, to Plato that that view of the kind of the cool dispassionate reason is picked up by argumentation and and has been the bedrock really of a theory of argument and argumentation for for thousands of years if you were to read almost any textbook on argumentation today it would tell you that the goal of argumentation is to marshal evidence in support of uh, of a reasoned decision uh, they'd probably go so far as to say that uh, there is a role for emotion, but we need to make sure that it does not overwhelm or get in the way of our reasoned decision making. Uh, so in this sense, argument and kind of a, a classic conception of argumentation is consistent with a classic view of rationality where there is a split between reason and emotion and reason is given the, the preeminent role in, in that equation. Uh, all of this is consistent with a view of Bayesian updating. There, the, the idea in this case is that people could receive information and they would update their opinion. The idea that we start from, from point A, we get new information, we update our opinion, and we get to point B. There's a, a classic kind of conception for me that has informed a lot of what I've done related to, to Bayesian updating, which is this idea that if, if a group of Bayesian thinkers were all exposed to the same information, in the ideal world, they would all reach the same conclusion. That is, rationality suggests that if we are all given the same information, there ought to be one logical conclusion that comes from that. And all of this is rooted in a, a strict kind of understanding of rationality that's separated from and, and really in many ways better than an affect or emotion driven view of the world. Okay, so that's, that's rationality. That is the ideal. And I got to tell you, I, I love this ideal. This, uh, I've been in debate. Uh, I mean, I was in debate. I guess that's a better way to say that. I don't coach the team anymore. I was in debate for more than 30 years of my life. So if you're doing the math, that's nearly two thirds of my life has been spent arguing with people. And debate, debate's really this awesome thing. I guess I wanna say, I, I love my experience in debate. It, it screws you up. Uh, you can talk to me about later some of the ways it makes me a terrible person. But one of the things it did is it conditioned me to believe in this classic conception of rationality because we, I taught students and I argued with people all the time and I, I believed that if I just found the best evidence, that the best evidence would always win the day. And that's because when a group of Bayesian thinkers is exposed to the same idea, we should all reach the same conclusion. But there's, there's a problem with that. And it's not just that I lost a couple of debates. I only lost a couple, but right, the, it's, more than, it's more than that. What, what I I've kind of come to figure out is that 
the Bayesian ideal of all of us reaching the same conclusion is real. It might be an ideal and it might be good, but it is not the way our brains are probably wired to work. And it's probably why we don't reach the, conclu the same conclusion all of the time. Um, I, I, I first began to figure this out with a series of studies I did in the early 2000 with politics, but I guess to pick up on one line that Andrew said about my experience, I, I work as a litigation consultant sometimes, and one of the things I've had the good fortune to watch are groups of jury eligible citizens recruited for a mock trial where they're given bits and pieces of evidence from a case and we watch them deliberate. And there is nothing more disheartening than watching people with real facts reason in wild ways. And it's not because they're not smart enough to come up with an answer. It's because people don't think the same way all of the time. And the question really is, how is it that we got to a place? Why is it that we're not Bayesian thinkers? And that's what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about today. All right. So, um, there is another view that does not prioritize reason over emotion, but links affect and affect and emotion and our prior beliefs to a view of rationality where you'll notice my brain here, my image changed. We are now not just the cogs spinning to be rational, but there is a, a role and a place and, and a linkage between emotion and, uh, and, and rationality. I want to start first by giving you the very short story of Phineas Gage. You might uh, know Phineas Gage. If you don't, be prepared. You're about to see an image of Phineas. Um, he was a railroad worker, 25 years old, uh, in 1848, the 1840s. Uh, where he had the terrible misfortune of having a steel rod uh, shot through his head while they were um, exploding, uh, you know, the, the mountain range so they could put a, a rail through, a railroad through. So uh, here's, here's Phineas. Um, you can see where the rod went through his head. Um, Phineas lived. Uh, uh, for all kinds of reasons, this is a medical miracle, I think, in the 1840s that somebody could have a, a, a steel rod run through their head and, and survive. But the, the, the powerful part of this story for us is that Phineas lost a part of his brain that dealt with affect, that dealt with emotion, that dealt with feelings. And what we've learned from Phineas and from other uh, people in his same situation, people who have had parts of their brain, let's say, you know, you know what I mean, they've lost a part of their brain and their brain function the same as him. They have lost affect. They've lost emotion. And it, here, I'll do everybody a favor of moving off that slide. Um, that they've, what, what happened is they lost the ability to, um, to they lost affect. But what it did, what we've learned that it did, is that it also impacted their ability to make rational decisions. Uh, there's an excellent book um, by Antonio Damasio called Descartes' Error, where he tells the story of Phineas Gage as well as other patients of his, including a, a guy named Elliot, who suffered a similar case. He had a, he had a brain tumor, and so they cut out the tumor, and he lost a very similar part of his, of his brain. And on the basis of Phineas Gage and Elliot and, and about 10 other people, what they figured out is that not only did they lose their uh, emotion, but they saw a similar degradation in their rational abilities as well. And that's because affect and rational thinking were linked because our decisions are influenced not merely by our rationality, but by the affect tied to that. As I remember, one of the stories of Elliot is that he couldn't decide what sandwich to eat one day. You know what I mean? This is a, this is a decision that actually should be quite simple for us, like sandwich A or sandwich B. But because he lost affect, because he lost emotion, he couldn't decide because he couldn't rem he couldn't figure out which one he liked better, which is normally the way we would make that decision. The, our likingness of that is the thing that helps us make a decision between sandwich A and sandwich B or even sandwich C. 
Anyway, these things tie neatly uh, with three other concepts that I want to summarize, uh, which have to do with hot cognition and automaticity and motivated reasoning. I'm here borrowing generously from the provost, the, the now provost at K-State, Chuck Tabor, uh, and his work. There's a lot of really good work in political psychology that has confirmed what we now know about how people think about socio-political concepts. And this notion of hot cognition is important to us. It's the idea that the information in our brain is not merely a series of facts, but facts that are connected to emotions. And so we have all of our, this information stored in our long-term memory. And as soon as you hear a word, a phrase, a concept, your, your brain gets flooded with all that you know about that topic, but also all that you feel about that topic. And, and I'll, I'll prove this to you right now. By it, when I say former President Trump, you are all now dealing with your working memory being flooded with what you know about former President Trump, but it is not merely what you know. It's a series of associations that are affectively charged, some strong and some weak, some positive and some negative, but it is not merely the concept of former President Trump that has meaning for you, but you have an affect associated with that as well. All right, so all of our socio-political concepts have some level of affect. The more experience you have with something, uh, the more likely it is that you might build up stronger connections, making them uh, more influential in the way you think about things. All right, so that's the hot cognition. We are affectively charged. Our memories are affectively charged so that our information has positive and negative associations for us. The other thing about the way our brain works, and I know people didn't think they were coming to brain lecture today, but, but the other thing about the way this works is that it happens incredibly quickly. All right, so our, in milliseconds, as soon as I said President Trump, your brain got flooded with a working memory, got flooded with all of that information and affect, and it takes milliseconds for that to happen in your brain. So. In, in essence, there's not really much you can do about it. I keep saying Trump just to make it so that everybody's got a, either a strong positive or negative a, a series of associations here, but it's they're, they're working in our brains. There wasn't anything you could do about it, and they're there, right? And here's, here's how this influences how we think and process information. Instead of in, being really engaged in a process of the classic sense of reasoning, we often find ourselves, dis our brains, working between being motivated by a goal for accuracy, right? Can we get the right answer to a question? But there is another motivation that animates us, and that is one that is partisan. That is where we have a desire to reach a particular conclusion. That is, we become motivated reasoners. And on topics where we have strong affect, on topics where we have strong opinions, motivated reasoning um, compels us, really. Our brains work to do two things. The first is we give a pass usually to information that is consistent with what we believe in. So when we hear things we like, that we agree with, they bring us pleasure in our brain because we, they, we agree with what that information is and we typically don't scrutinize it very, very seriously. But information when we encounter that runs contrary to what we believe, we are motivated reasoners where we are very good at finding the criticisms and flaws in the information that, that we are exposed to. And motivated reasoning then turns the traditional view of rationality and the traditional view of argumentation on its head because instead of evidence influencing our opinions, our opinions are now influencing our evaluation of the evidence. 
and that is the opposite view of rationality that the classic view starts from. Is that that's my that's my overview, I guess. People I suppose will unmute if there was a question. Okay. Then I'm gonna keep yep, we do have one question. Right. From Meredith Dwyer. Yep. Passes, does emotion have less of an impact on thoughts and decisions? For example, people that have strong emotions regarding Trump, will those emotions and their impact on perception or reasoning change over time as those emotions dull? Um, well, they would. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose your, your intense liking or disliking of the former president may fade over time because you have fewer and fewer uh, opportunities to think about the former president. And so that would... Uh, atrophy is probably the wrong word, but the, you know your, your brain will move on to having more intense associations with other things. But but it's I don't think that your your intensity of the affect would change, but not necessarily the direction of the affect. So you might whatever it is positive or negative that would remain, but the intensity with which because it would move on or just be less relevant in some ways to the decisions that you're going to make decisions 20 years from now about a particular policy are less likely to be animated by your view of the former president because he'll be removed many times over from um, as former. Okay, I, I want to share a series of studies that I've done over the last 15 to 20 years to try to put the way motivated reasoning works into practice to, to show the difficulty that we have with rationally evaluating information. And, and to me, this is among the biggest challenges that we have because the goal is to use things like presidential debates and political fact-checking and evidence to make good policy. But the problem is our, our motivations probably get in the way some. All right, so uh, let, me, let me start with political debates for uh, a second. You might remember these two. Uh, presidential debate from 2004 between former President George Bush and, and then uh, Senator John Kerry. Uh, in this particular study, one of the things we did was we had 50 registered voters from Sedgwick County come to actually to KPTS to watch the debate that night and we used uh, dial tracking we had a piece of technology that today looks quite antiquated if it looks like a, a cell phone from the early 1980s um, but it has a dial on it and we, we told people that they could turn the dial between um, 1, uh, 0 and 10 right so we told them five was the midpoint. So if what you're hearing is totally neutral, then set it to five, let it, let it be neutral. As you hear something you agree with, let the amount of in or intensity of agreement cause you to move that dial up from six to 10. So if you hear something you like a little, then you might move it to six or seven. You hear something you hear quite a bit, you like quite a bit, you move it up to eight or nine. You hear something that's fabulous, move it all the way up to 10. Similarly, the other direction, if you hear something you dislike, move it maybe down to three or four, something you really dislike, down to one or two, and all the way to zero if it's something you absolutely hate. Okay, so uh, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so we have 50 people in the room, they're watching this, this uh, presidential debate, and each second the computer is recording what their reaction is on our scale. A after the debate was over, we compiled all of that uh, those data points together and then we replotted the average based on whether the um, person who was watching the debate was a registered Democrat or a registered Republican and you can see a, a four minute segment of the presidential debate uh, at that time and one of the things that's um, really I think unmistakable about this is that you can always tell which candidate was speaking based on which line was higher because at no point in the debate did Democrats ever differ from Republicans. At no point in the debate were Democrats and Republicans ever the same or even close. You know what I mean? You can see here that uh, there was big disagreements. That's a, you know an average of nine for one side and four for the other. 
uh, the, sometimes the gaps get smaller, but the differences were always statistically significant. And you can see they get split right away. Uh, the, the chart here is, uh, I, if any of you remember debates from you know two decades ago, this makes a little bit of sense. Let me tell you, the, the second half of the chart there is the beginning of a new question, right? So as soon as the question, by the way, the, the point where all the lines are together, that's the moderator talking, right? That's the question being asked by the moderator. It's the one time everybody agreed. So they got, they all came together when the moderator agreed. And then as soon as that question was over, boom, you know what I mean? E immediately viewpoints begin to diverge. And then you can see the first part of this chart here. That's the end of a question. And then the short segments are the kind of follow-ups that used to happen in debates where people would be given a little bit of time. And so you can see the, the one candidate started to speak and immediately opinions flipped. And then the, the other candidate spoke again and immediately they flipped. And that's because, think about how sad this is for our politics. We use presidential debates to help us decide which candidate is you know, better, you know, smarter, more fit for the job. And at no point in this debate was one side willing to say their person was not as good as they wanted them to be. They were always higher. This happened in 2000. So this is from 2004. It happened again in 2008 and again in 2012. I've done a similar. I stopped using our old technology, but I started. We do the same study each time where we ask people which candidate won the segment of the debate that they're on. You all might remember the debate between Barack Obama uh, and Mitt Romney that happened, the first debate between them. I'll remind you, it's the one where Obama got beat. Right, it's the one where he was flat. The very first debate. It's don't worry, it's okay. You know, and if you liked him, it's it, he still won. Uh, but here's the thing: he lost. Like, come on now. You know what I mean? He was flat. Romney had a bunch of facts. There was just it, it, it's hard to believe that people who watched that debate would not have thought that Mitt Romney did the better job of debating. But we had about 175 people watching that debate, and there was a statistically significant difference based on your prior political affiliation and who you thought won the debate. And that's because people always check in for their candidates. We had people write their thoughts once uh, about the quality of the arguments, and the, a thought listing exercise showed the same thing. People wrote negative comments about the other candidate and positive comments about their own candidate, reinforcing the idea that we are motivated reasoners. We check in for and give a pass to our person, regardless of whether they maybe actually did or did not win the debate. Okay, that's uh, presidential debates. Cheryl, any presidential debate questions for me? No, but uh, there's a question from earlier. Um, Chinieri, uh, Okafor asked, um, do other areas influence the reasoning process such as gender and the environment? Um, uh, I know influence the reasoning process. Is that, was that the question? Yes. Uh, that's well, I'll first defer and say that's, that's definitely a little beyond my, what I study and what I know, what I, uh, to me, uh, the, our, our lived experiences, and, and a part of the question includes this, our lived experiences influence what we know, what we believe, and what we value. And all of those things impact how we, pro not, not, the, not actually whether you're logical or not, right? But they process how you interpret information. So it's not so much that uh, any of those demographic factors are themselves determinative of whether or not you're a better or worse thinker. They impact your lived experience and how you make sense of the world. And whether you likely say something was true or false, weak or strong, good or bad. Hi. Yep. There's also another question, Jeff, from Keith Newfeld. Can't this graph also, the graph that you just showed, uh, can it also represent that viewers have a bimodal distribution of desires and the candidates resonated with the polarized opinions? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, yeah, if, the, if you mean, Keith, it, I guess the thing that's weird to me is that at no point in the debate did, did people ever say, yeesh, 
my, my candidate. That was a bad, you know what I mean? Like a, a bad answer. The, this debate in particular, there, there was a moment, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember the debate now. It's, it's been a minute. Uh, there was a moment where Bush said the economy was doing well and like FYI, it was not doing well at all. And, and both numbers dipped. And so there is, there, it is true that people are not, people are not stupid, but you know what I mean? Like they, they, they know. And so Republicans and Democrats both turned the knob down because they both recognized that it was not, you know, that there were, there were not perfect signs in the economy, but the Republican number still stayed above average stayed above the the midpoint line and more importantly now that that, that's a moment where you'd think if bayesian thinkers exposed to the same information ought to reach the same conclusion that we ought to be able to decide whether things are you know true or false right or wrong i, I think we'll get a bit uh, uh, as i as i'm often apt to do i'm rambling a little i got a couple of slides that'll answer that so hold tight how about that as an answer for a second let's do this let me talk a little bit about fact checking provides an excellent opportunity for us to kind of get at this a little bit more. So fact checking, I mean, geez, fact checking ought to be the best thing ever for us. You know what I mean? Like candidates on both sides say wildly inaccurate and sometimes intentionally false and misleading information. And isn't it great for us? We have journalists who come along and point out when things are not true. Uh, and, and that ought to be a moment where people can learn from and, and change their opinion about a particular thing. I, I've done a number of studies related to fact checking, and I am here to tell you that as great as fact checking is, it does not work for us very well. Uh, people do not change their opinions nearly as much as they should. Let me show you a couple of slides. I'm gonna give, give you the results from one study. Happy to talk about this and some other ones I've done in more detail, but these are the slides that I have. Um, the first set of these studies I did had to do with um, healthcare uh, between uh, Obama and, and Mitt Romney. You can see here, this is a pretty short claim. Uh, so what I did is I showed people a claim and then I had them evaluate the strength of the claim, right? So I've, what I've tried to do is try to figure out how weak or strong people think arguments are. So I would show them a claim. I would then show them a fact check and ask them to evaluate the strength of the fact check. And then I would ask them to evaluate the claim again, like basically like, hey, did, you, did this change your mind? at all, okay? So uh, the very first set of these studies I did had to do with claims by Obama and Romney related to health care. Uh, and I showed them this sentence, uh, you know, about from Obama that um, health care reform um, would be cost beneficial because it's a lot cheaper to prevent an illness than to treat one. Uh, and I'm, that, that makes sense. Some of our medical treatments are really expensive, you know what I mean? Uh, I showed a similar claim from Romney, obviously kind of in the opposite, which is that repealing Obamacare would have saved a lot of money, right? So again, the thing I, I want you all to notice is that these claims that I showed people to evaluate on, on first blush, there's not much there. Does that make sense? Very limited in terms of detail, mostly a claim, hardly even any evidence, all right? But I did tell them who they came from. I then showed people a fact check, and I, I, there's no test later. I know this is probably way too small for anybody to read. I apologize. But think of it this way. In terms of the amount of information somebody was given, they were given a very brief statement by a candidate and a pretty thorough fact check that said, by the way, in both of those cases, that they're wrong. All right. Barack Obama's claim that preventative care saves money is not accurate. It was rated as uh, false by nonpartisan fact checkers, mostly because, and by the way, the evidence for this one is pretty damning if you read it. Like the New England Journal of Medicine says it's not true. The CBO said it's not true. Like nonpartisan groups said he was not telling that, you know, that it was an exaggerated claim. Um, uh, same about Mitt Romney, they, they rate it false, right? So I showed people that limited claim and a really big fact check. And in all of the cases, what I asked them to do is use this particular scale to evaluate the quality of the argument that was made by both, right? And you can see here that it's 
essentially asking them how correct, how, how sound, how well reasoned and reasonable an argument was. Uh, and I asked them to use this scale at three points after they saw the original claim, after they saw the fact check, so they evaluated the original claim, they evaluated the fact check, and they evaluated the claim a, a second time, all right, using the exact same scale. Uh, and here's, here's, a, here's, here's a numeric representation of what I found. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a graph here in a second. That'll make this a lot easier to make sense of. But I can tell you basically what happened, and, and this, makes, this will probably make a lot of sense. Democrats thought that the statement from Obama was really strong, that the fact check was pretty weak, and that they still thought the, the statement from Obama was pretty strong. Republicans thought the statement from Obama was weak. You can see the difference there on our scale, 22 versus 35. They thought that statement was from Obama was weak. They thought that fact check was amazing. They thought it was really strong. And then they still thought, right, you could see their number went down. They were like, oh, yeah, no, I really hate that Obama statement. It's even worse than I realized. But in case you think that there's partisan, it, goes, it cuts both ways, when Democrats were shown the Romney statement, they thought it was in the, you know, in the tank. They thought it was terrible. They loved the fact check and they still hated the Romney statement. Republicans mirrored Democrats for Obama. They loved the Romney statement. They hated the fact check and they loved Romney's statement in the end. The, re the reality is that exposure to an, an extensive fact check providing overwhelming evidence that the claim made by their candidate was wrong was viewed as a weak argument and people maintained their commitment to their original candidate and comment even after learning that it was likely false. Right, to maybe make it uh, easier to read, this is an example, this is the just the simple plot of Democrat and Republican opinion about the Obama statement after they learned it was false. And there is still an incredible gap between the average rating for Democrats and the average rating for Republicans because a group of Bayesian thinkers exposed to the same information did not reach the same conclusion. They still differed dramatically. And that's, I think, to circle back because our affect and commitment to candidate is probably way more powerful than any individual claim. So we use our commitment to the candidate to scrutinize, and, and you know what I mean. We we're not going to give up on our candidate. So we we've got to think their arguments are are powerful. By the way, I've repeated this on on just so many topics: gun control, immigration, uh, tax cuts, and a, a long list of things where people replicate the same problem. Okay, statistical evidence. Uh, I, it occurred to me that maybe the problem is not just that people are not good at evaluating arguments. Maybe we need to do things that are more granular and just get down to the nitty gritty in terms of what, how people understand a basic fact, right? So stats, by the way, struck me as the, the first best place to go. Statistics tell us just fundamental things like whether something is big or small. You know what I mean? Like surely we could agree on whether a number is large or small. So uh, I conducted a, a series of tests, study one. I, I promise not to bore you with a whole series of studies, but uh, I asked people a, a simple question. I gave them a stat, roughly three quarters of Americans now own a smartphone. And I asked them to use my now time honored semantic differential scale, where I asked them to just tell me whether they thought that was a lot or a little. And here's an interesting thing. On a, on a topic without much affect, right, on a non-political topic, for every demographic factor that I, I looked at, there was no statistically significant difference between any demographic group and their assessment of whether 75, 77% is a large number or not. They all checked in at ba that basically being a pretty large number. Does that make sense? Like, we all agree about whether 77%, where that fits on the scale from like zero to 100, 77, by the way. So we know where that is in terms of large or small. People did not disagree. But I also asked them at the same time a different politically charged topic. I, asked, I told them in the last six months of the Obama administration, 1.1 million jobs were created. And I asked them to assess 
whether 1.1 million jobs was a lot of jobs or not. And it's the exact same scale where I asked them, just like 77% of smartphones, is 1.1 million a lot or a little? I asked half of the people this question. As you can imagine, I asked half of the people. I told them in the first six months of the Trump administration, 1.1 million new jobs were created. And I'm sure you can all tell where this is going right now. Democrats rated the Obama number as a large number. Yeah, good, I got a slide about that. Democrats rated the Obama number as a large number. And Democrats rated the exact same number when attributed to Trump as a low number. And Republicans did the opposite. They rated the Trump number as a large number of jobs to be created and the Obama number as a small number of jobs to be created because our political commitment in, in, interfered with, influenced our understanding of whether that's a big or a small number. And to me, that's like super tragic because if we can't even agree on whether 1.1 million jobs is a lot of jobs to create in six months or not, how in the are we ever going to figure out if a policy is a good or a bad policy, whether we should or should not invest in a policy if we can't even agree on whether that number of jobs being created would be a good or a bad thing for us to do, all right, uh, because we disagree. Um, by the way, I've done this with a, a series of other uh, statistics. In all cases, the non-political numbers always produced non-statistically significant differences and the political numbers based on political interest always influenced your interpretation. So a similar graph to this one appeared in all those other times. From Jennifer, uh, what about those individuals who were not registered as either Democratic or Republican who were unaffiliated? Yeah, this is a really good question. I, I should say this, especially because my slide doesn't say Democrats and Republicans. It used liberal and conservative. Um, so I, I asked uh, the, the much better way to get. I, I have been talking exclusively about political ideology. And I want to be clear that motivated reasoning is larger than our partisan commitments. It's our prior motivations. Uh, at the talk in the fall that we, when we, when we did a, a small version of this, I asked people uh, to rate credibility of the um, director of the CDC uh, in terms of the assessment about whether we should put kids back in school or not, and whether people should wear masks or not. And they rated, I'm jumping ahead to my authority slide, but they rated the credibility high or low based on whether or not their, whether or not they wanted to send kids back to school or not. So it's not always our political ideology. The important thing about motivated reasoning, it's our prior affect, whatever that affect is, influences us to interpret the information this way. Here's my, my favorite quote about statistics, which is that the role of statistics is to resolve disagreements among people. And I think the thing to kind of think is that rather than resolving the disagreements, we disagree about what the statistics mean. Uh, draw, the appeal to statistics is no longer one that might help us resolve disputes, but might actually initiate disputes among people. All right, the last um, thing I want to mention it has to do with evidence from authority. I've moved on from statistics, and now I'm trying to figure out if not just statistical evidence is subject to motivated reasoning, but evidence from authority is also subject to this. And uh, I've started to do a series of studies where I've asked people to evaluate the credibility of the um, of the person, there's an attribution um, of some evidence. So I've asked people about whether minimum wage would cause jobs to increase or decrease, um, you know, other economic policies. I want to share briefly a slide with you, uh, a recent study I did about whether or not former President Trump should be impeached or not. So you might remember that there was a question about former President Trump and whether or not we should impeach the president. And there, there were two questions really to be addressed. One had to do with whether he could be impeached, right? Whether constitutionally a person who had been, who had left office could even be impeached. And then whether or not he should be impeached. That's kind of the second question. And so I, I showed people a series of pieces of evidence 
uh, to build a case, I'm interested in whether or not different conditions or different amounts of authority would influence people's opinions. So impeachment condition here, I'm going to interpret my slide for you real quick. My impeachment condition, uh, the three lines there, represent uh, a, a group of 150 legal scholars. There was a, a you know, like a, a, a released statement from 150 leading legal scholars. So I showed people in one instance an attribution to the vague 150 legal scholars, a list of uh, 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 reference, so that's condition one, just 150 leading scholars say he can be impeached. Second condition was 150 scholars, including, and then it listed off three of the, three or four of the most prominent names in the list. And condition three is um, that the leading constitutional scholar on this question says. Okay, and then impeachment groups uh, can try them one or two in the bottom is their prior belief about whether or not the president should have been um, impeached or not. All right, so some people told me whether they thought he should be impeached and others said he should not be impeached. And the thing that's to me just unmistakable from this chart is that it did not matter who was providing the information, whether it was 150 constitutional scholars, 150 with the names and qualifications of some of them, or frankly, just the best person in our country on this particular constitutional question. If you thought the president should be impeached, you didn't care. You always thought they were qualified. That's why all of those numbers are up above 5.5 on a scale that goes to seven. And if you thought the president should not be impeached, you didn't care one iota if those people were qualified or not, or whether almost every leading scholar thought so or not, you still always thought that it was they were not qualified, and you always thought in a statistically significant difference that they were not qualified. And that's because your prior opinion about whether he should have been impeached was likely impacting your assessment of their credibility. So, uh, so with that kind of in mind, there are now two of our like three most basic pieces of evidence where our prior commitments, and this speaks, I think, to Jenny's question before, it's not partisan um, about whether the president should be impeached or not. I mean, it was, but this, this case here is a clear example of just your prior commitment that he should be impeached definitively influencing whether or not you thought the people who made that judgment were credible or not in the first place. And that's troublesome, at least to me, because uh, I, I live in a world where I think we should rely on people who know to tell us what the answers to tough questions are. Most of us are never going to have the ability to know enough. And so we rely on experts to help us with that, uh, whether it's, um, you know, difficult science questions. I mean, the, 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 the threats to science today strike me as the most obvious case, but in all manners, constitutional law and beyond, the, we need experts in medicine to tell us whether or not something is safe or not. And um, if our prior commitments shape our interpretations of their authority, it calls the whole question of reasoning from authority into question. And that's, and now I'm happy to take more questions that are in the chat. Yeah, thank you. This is fascinating. There are some more questions that have uh, jumped into the chat, so I'm going to ask them. Uh, the first is from Amy Tully. If affect trumps reason in your example of political debates, how can we, the people, move toward a middle road or balance of evaluating something on equal parts affect and reasoning? Yeah, it's a great question. I think I might have just ended my lecture with, and we're all doomed, and I didn't mean for it to be quite so bad. Um, there, you know, there, there really are effort, there are ways to debias people's judgments and push people toward wanting to make a decision rooted in um, accuracy rather than motivated reasoning. The very good news for all of you is that knowing that motivated reasoning is a thing on its face reminds us, and you're now all in the, you're all in the club, you all know that we might be making decisions this way, and that alone, uh, giving people that foresight knowledge that they might be 
engaged in motivated reasoning is a corrective in and of itself. Now the problem is all of your friends on Facebook, they don't know that, so they're still sharing things that you wish they weren't sharing. Um, you, you all won't do that, but your friends and not friends will still share that information. Um, it is, the answer really is that it's challenging to, to get people off their emotional commitments. I am a big believer that rational argument still wins out in the end. That is in the long term, we do, uh, right, the marketplace of ideas and the best ideas do win out in the long term. The, the, the problem is, and the, you know, the, the, the dangerous thing is that we don't have the long term to make political decisions. They make decisions much more quickly than the long term. Um, and, and so we're in a real bind. I'm happy to report that there's a, a really, there's a really good unpublished study from me that shows that participation in high school and college debate served as a corrective to uh, motivated reasoning as well. Um, one one of my unpub one of my unpublished studies. So. Okay, another question from Jennifer. How can we accurately measure whether 1.1 million jobs is a lot without a basis of comparison for the figure? What about context? What is the unemployment rate before and after? And can the number have greater meaning outside of affect without context? Yeah, this is a really, that's a great question. I, I, here's the, most of us make decisions under real levels of uncertainty. You know what I mean? Where we don't know what, what it is that we're judging. And, and there's great evidence, uh, there, there's other theories about how people, where we go to make decisions when we don't know you know things and we go to think we you know we, we go to the place that we're most comfortable most familiar with to make a decision but here's the thing that really struck me that in three or four non-political statistical uh, statistics there was never a difference and that's striking to me and in every case of political statistic there was a statistically significant difference and it 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 is a little revealing to me that frankly i ask people about traffic accidents adult ownership of game consoles which by the way i pegged at 40% which is a, a tougher number right about whether that's a large or small number the number of traffic accidents that occur in a day and and cell phone ownership and there was never a difference in how people judge those those differences only always manifest in political context so i, I think the question is right when we don't know we don't know and but what so what happens is because most people don't have the time or energy to figure it out the thing that we know that we go to is the affect and in the case of being assigned to a politician whether they are somebody in our in our club or not in our club and um and, and i mean you're absolutely right we had, there there ought to be I'm, if you're asking me, am I on team is 1.1 million a lot of jobs? I definitely want to be on the team that decides if that is or is not a lot of jobs. But because that's a politically charged question, we disagree about that right now. We're getting close to the end of time, Jeff, uh, but there's two questions I, I want to ask. Um, first is from Keith Pickus. If rationale reasoning can ultimately prevail, how do we explain the increasingly partisan atmosphere we live in here in the United States and throughout the world? Can it be that human behavior has changed so dr drastically in recent decades that previous understanding of rationality and self-interest have changed drastically? Um, you know, I, I mean, I obviously agree, Keith, that we live in an increasingly partisan atmosphere. And this takes me well, well off of today's talk, but that's driven by a number of factors, including the fact that we have 24 seven access to uh, a source of media that is not, I mean, people increasingly self-select information that is consistent with what they believe in and they have increasing amounts of access to it and and frankly you know here let me 
cable news is here. I'm, I'm definitely getting far afield here, but let me just blurt a few things out. Like, what's the news show on CNN? What is the news show? Not 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 the talk about the news, but actually like literally what constitutes news on MSNBC. I know it constitutes talk about news, but not the news. I mean, to me, the problem is that there is money in politics and news to be made by making talk about news more relevant than news. And I say that because it makes it just harder for us to get facts because it's because facts don't sell nearly as well as opinions. And so, um, you know, they're not they're, they're, even if you could tell me like you could type into the chat right now what the news show is I'd say like well that's good but that's not the bulk of what's on the news networks it's the not news programming uh, I don't know that we've changed but it we have increasingly increasingly been exposed to and find comfort in there's a fascinating study by Drew Weston who did fMRI studies of people's brains when they were exposed to information that was either contrary to or consistent with their political beliefs and it's fascinating to watch our the part of our brain that is pleasure gets excited when we learn of inconsistencies in our opponents arguments because we, we know they've like made a, a contradiction uh, I, I don't know that we've changed as much as what we get exposed to now has changed and that's in, and that's impacted who we are great okay the last last thing Jeff I'm gonna I'm gonna save the chat and send it to you because there's a very interesting discussion going on here um, and one comment that Keith Newfeld made was that this is mortifying for all of us and <laughs> And to follow up with that from Chinuri Okafor, the science of this presentation is logical and your presentation is awesome, but the data you presented is a bit depressing. Wow. Actually, reason is no longer reason. Please say something more to help me reconcile this anomaly. Chinuri, you are too kind. Let me say this. Um, first off, I think what this suggests, I, I do have a couple of thoughts about this. First is that we should remember People have an incredible capacity to reason. We are not bad at reasoning. Our brains are powerful and we can scrutinize information well. And maybe to, to circle back to why this series is being sponsored by the College of Liberal Arts and our commitment to diversity of opinions, the thing that people really need to do, the reason why there is hope is that teaching people and training people to respect a diversity of opinions, to be aware of the diversity of thought in the world is the powerful corrective to be, ex when we are exposed to and become familiar with the idea that there are competing points of view, we can in the long term, we, we know, figure out how to distinguish things that are um, more likely true than not and things that are less likely true than not and the commitment to learning a commitment to lifelong learning encourages us to, to expose ourselves to information and we've been trained by the variety of disciplines that we're all in to, to learn how to scrutinize that and and people do and they can and they and they will it just maybe takes a little bit longer than than a day well, Jeff, thank you very much. Um, everyone, before we close, I just want to uh, share with you again information about the series next week. I hope you will be able to join us. Um, Mark McCormick, who many of us know, uh, he is the Director of Strategic Communications for the ACLU of Kansas. Many of us also knew him when he was at the Wichita Eagle and the Kansas African American Museum. He will be joining us next week at 2 o'clock. Uh, to talk about assets and deficits, establishing an African-American narrative. And for the Zoom information, it will remain the same as it is this week. Uh, but if you want to read up a little bit more about what Mark will be talking about, please go to www.wichita.edu slash reality. So again, Jeff, thank you. This was fascinating. Thank and um, I hope to see everyone again next week. Thank you all.